Anthony Pellegrino, welcome to the Do Business, Do Life podcast. Glad to have you here, man. Thanks for having me. Or I should say, I'm glad for you to have me here because we're actually recording <laughs> in your recording studio. Yes. This is a first ever. Yeah. Yeah. You're normally on site in your own uh, house, right? Your own element. So, yeah. So as sheer coincidence would have it, we're hosting an event in Chicago. Yeah. We had a podcast to do. You're like, just swing by. I've got the, you have a beautiful office, by the way, but this was part of the build out was actually build a studio with inside your office. Correct. Correct. So we're going to get to the why behind that later. That'll be fun. Yeah. But um, for those that don't know Anthony, I figured I was trying to think like for a guy I've known over a decade now, we've really grown up in the business together. Sure. How do we take listeners that don't know Anthony and just start this off on the right foot? And the more I thought about it, it was obvious. And it had to start with the phone call. <laughs> the call. The phone call. <laughs> that, 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 yep. So I'll set this up. Yeah. And then I'd love for you to hear or you to explain your side of it. Sure. Yeah. Well, so this was, for you listeners out there, this was many years ago. So this think picture a young Brad. And this was at a previous organization. And this was back in the days where I was grinding it out. Cold calls. I think I had a, maybe one other team member on my side. But worked with a few offices across the country. And so one day, I'm working past five, married to my wife, Sarah, had no kids at the time, so that was kind of our deal, like a couple nights a week, I'd just work a little late, do some catch up, maybe even make some late night phone calls to catch an advisor after hours, yep. didn't have the gatekeeper there. So in those days, if it was after hours and you know, instead of ringing to a voicemail, it would actually ring up front to the reception. And then if that didn't get answered, then it would ring to the rest of the office. It's like a phone tree. Yes. Yeah. So, so literally everybody's phone would ring after hours. And I happened to, it was, had to be 5.45, 6 p.m., maybe uh, 7. On Friday, right? I don't remember what day. Was it was a yeah, grind. I, pretty sure. Yeah. Was it was a man. I was just a grind. Yeah. I was exactly. grinding at the yeah. place. And so I remember sitting at my desk, the phone rings. I pick it up and there's two guys on the phone. It's you and your brother, Mike. Yep. And I don't remember the exact open, but it's, hey, this is Anthony and Mike Pellegrino. We got this piece of mail or got this voicemail you sent out and we wanted to check in on this event you've got coming up here in a few weeks. So anyway, so I'm answering the phone, pulling up Anthony Pellegrino in the CRM and literally there's no notes. There's one word, all caps, and it just says whale. <laughs> that's, that, that's like, it's like left message, whale. Yeah. And so I had no other context, but back back in those days, a whale was, oh, this, this guy does a lot of business, you know, top prospect, all that. And so you were not, so the way we did it back then, you would be assigned prospects if, you know, if you reached out, that was your guy for the next 30 or 45 days. Yeah. So this was actually... So my other buddy, Brad, by the way, for listening to this, um, you still owe me that 30 pack of Keystone for, for this phone call. Th th this is true. Cause I didn't know which Brad we were ending up with. I thought it was you and ended up being it, which worked out too. So, so there were two Brads yeah. and the other Brad had left you a message. He was gone for the day, but I was like, well, I'm here. Might as well do this sales call. Yeah. And then what proceeded was a 60 minute marathon phone call. Yeah. I, the best thing I can compare it to was like a verbal sparring match yes. where, you know, we were ducking, we were weaving and, um, it was fun. Though. It was, yeah. I remember instantly in that phone call, just like, wow, these guys, they're super successful, but they like to have fun. They don't take themselves too seriously. And I just remember an instant rapport in that phone call. For sure. Yeah. So let, let's hear your side of it. And then we'll get into, uh, the rest of where your story went from there. Well, you know, it's interesting too, man, Brad, to think the word whale. I mean, now you're going back 13, 14 years ago, but, you know, with all due respect to anyone, whatever type of business you're writing, but, you know, 13, 14 years ago was $25 million of new production was considered a whale. Yeah. That here we are, you know, 13 years later, not looked at as so much. Still great year, great business, but whale, you know? Yeah. Uh, so... Yeah, look, I, at that time, I was pretty comfortable with who we were working with, right? That that FMO at that time. So I, I really had no reason to change. So for me, I was like, all right, well, let me check these guys out. You said a, a really nice uh, marketing piece and it 
made a lot of sense. So I just wanted to feel you out. And I remember on the call that that you were using some phenomenal takeaways. You know, it's like, I'm like, well, I'm thinking about it. I'll let you know. And you're like, let me know. Like, there's only lawn seats left. So <laughs> you're not even going to make it into this event. We, we have to let you in. So it was one one heck of a sparring match, and, and it was fun. We were both having fun with it. And the conclusion was we ended up attending. Yeah. Uh, went out to that New York event and, you know, met you guys, you and the other Brad. And, yeah, it was a continuation of the call to where uh, we ended up working together and turned into a phenomenal, you know, friendship. Here we are 13-plus years later. So yeah. I remember being yeah. there. The Guggenheim Museum in New York was where we hosted part of it. Mm -hmm. And I remember you actually stopping me in the <laughs> mid-conversation. You go, well, can I just stop you right there? And I'm like thinking to myself, uh-oh, did I, did I offend them? Or where? You go, that was a phenomenal takeaway quiz. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we were literally dissecting yeah. the sales. Yeah, well, oh, yeah. no fly. But I do remember that was the only time we had that experience scheduled. So I'm like, honestly, guys, this is the only one that we've got. So I'd love to tell you, hey, if you can't make this one, you're really busy, come to the next one. Yeah. But it, it was just like a really fun conversation. And I remember then you were even early. I remember one of the reasons you came out, you were exploring how do I start to, you were obviously, I'm going to say prolific yeah. as far as live seminars. You were doing more than almost anyone at the time. And we'll get to where that's evolved here in a little bit. Sure. But you were always one of the things I remember even from that first call, you were always a student of the game where you were constantly challenging and like, hey, where is this thing going? Where is marketing going? Yep. How is it evolving? And one of the conversations there was a gentleman that was driving a lot of business online. Yeah. And it's really cool to see how you've continued to evolve and now you actually have a full blown team member. Yeah. Responsible for nothing but online lead gen. Correct. And Director of Digital Marketing. Marketing. Yeah, brought a director of digital marketing. To your point, Brad, still I'm I still am a student of the game. Mm -hmm. I still maintain a, a thirst to what's next, what's next, where's this industry evolving to? And I think that's what keeps you sharp. Um, some of the things you've you know taught me over the years and some really good books, I think good to great and in um, you know, money makes people lazy, mm -hmm. right? I love a great quote by Bill Parcells. I was watching an interview, a uh, former New York Giants football coach and coach of Patriots, what have you. And they were asking about one of his players, and he said, you know what I told him? Don't let good enough be good enough. And that resonated with me. And really, because once you start achieving success, you can kind of just descend a little bit and relax. But uh, And we could talk more about that as we go on how my mindset changed to when we get into kind of a point about me burning out where I saw that happening, but now I'm at a point where I never have felt better about the business, um, hungrier, happier, and it's kind of odd that all those things come together, right? Mm -hmm. Because typically when, when you're on burnout and grinding, grinding, you go the other way. Sometimes your, your happiness is the thing that can sacrifice and dwindle as a result of it. So. But uh, yeah, man, student of the game, keep keep learning and everything. Yes. Uh, so on that note, let's kind of give a short version of your journey through finance. Um, you were fairly young into it then because you and your brother did incredibly well in the mortgage business. Yep. And then 08, 09 happened and that imploded for everyone, yes. which I think was kind of the door opening into the finance world of finance. Yep. And so I'm trying to think. That was probably a 2011, 12 phone call sometime in there. Yeah, I don't, no, 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 doesn't no, even know where that. Yeah. It was like probably 2010, I want to say 10. Okay, yeah. it's probably 2010. But yeah, so you know, with us, we had a successful mortgage business, yeah. and at the time, I mean, we were just cranking business. And even with that, it wasn't like a traditional mortgage company. We were dealing with a lot of re real estate investors. Uh -huh. So it was more about real estate investing and, and how you can leverage equity in one property by, by, by another, another, another. And we kind of aligned ourselves with some financial advisors and we were referring business back and forth. Well, I found myself at a position when 
2007, 2008, as the market started to crash, I found myself, you know, our industry was getting crushed. And I said, wait a second, I'm referring, I'm bringing the financial advisors we're working with, I'm bringing them more business than, than they are us, right? And in fact, just to a point, we were bringing them more business than they were generating for themselves outside of us. So as the industry was collapsing on the mortgage side, it was like, wait, we can do this. So we kind of stepped on the, the, the lily pad, you know, of safety as that industry collapsed, went all in on the financial side, attained all the proper licenses, what have you, and then just took off. Wow. Well, the thing that I've always seen with you and your brother, Mike, because back in those days, you two were kind of a side-by-side -side tandem. I now know he's your COO, which is even... It's, it's just really cool to see the dynamic you guys are around the business with. Yeah. Um, but you guys, the first time I met you, you kind of had that that just grind, right? It's like you were willing to grind. You were like, whatever it takes. Yeah. I know we brought the Enneagram into our community. For those that know the Enneagram, Enneagram 3, which is the achiever, which is like wherever the board is, you're yeah. going to be at the top of it. So yeah. our personality and one of the things when we first connected, you were grinding. Were you doing triple digit seminars? Did you ever get to a hundred plus seminars? Uh, no. Or was it just knocking uh, on the door? Knocking on the door. It was in the, the 80, 90, yeah. 90 a year. In so your, in your production was like, that was the thing I saw as production wise, you know, what new assets gathered. You were always at the top of the board, wherever you were at, you know, whatever organization you were at. And then there came a point, uh, and family dynamic, married to your beautiful wife, Rosalind, three boys at home. Yep. And I think as entrepreneurs, I've fallen victim to this. I know you've shared with me, like, hey, this was a thing I had to work through. It was kind of the grind for the benefit of the family. Like, hey, I'm working so hard yep. so I can provide for my family back home. Yep. And you shared some stories where that just kind of started to like hit you upside the head of like, wait, Am I, am I truly looking at this through the right lens? So I'd love, like, there was one, I think there was one story where you tried to join the <laughs> Chicago Marathon, but you were actually registered or something like that. So I just love your take, because I know there are a lot of advisors have kind of felt that red line burnout. Yeah, they, production, they were killing it, but just out of whack, out of balance. Yes. You know, it's funny because, Brad, if I look back, right, so in those days doing, you know, 90 seminars in a year as an individual to right 25 million dollars of business to now where our company's doing less than that i'm only doing you know half of those mind you right so maybe i'm doing you know 30 or 40 in a year and another advisor's doing the, the other half but but less than we were and instead of writing you know 25 million this year we're pushing 250 million so you think about that right it's it's a decade later 10x the amount of production mm -hmm. with literally less seminars than before. So there's a dynamic there. But taking it back to the early days, yeah, look, I'm just like many of the other advisors out there that started in the beginning. I had it in my mindset, 90% of the financial advisors fail. What can I do? I was driven still into this day, driven by fear of failure, mm -hmm. fear of failing. And I did whatever it, it took. And in the early days, yeah, I'd work in seven days a week. I'd go six days a week in the office, Monday through Friday, meeting with Saturday meetings. Mm -hmm. And Sunday mornings, I would drive a uh, 45 minute drive from the suburbs out in Naperville, Illinois to downtown Chicago and uh, drive down for years, did a live radio show. So it wasn't pre-recorded, right? It was live. Wow. So, and, and in fact, your point about the mar marathon, so first first year we're doing a radio show, the station, WLS, major station, 100-year record, you know, uh, failed to tell me, oh, Anthony, for the live show you're coming down for, be careful. Uh, you're going to have to come down like two hours early. So came down, police were directing me all every direction, and I'm looking at the clock, and I'm like, this show starts in like 20 minutes. The police officers directed me almost on Lake Michigan pretty much. I found a parking garage finally. I had about seven block run to get to the station. So I'm booking, right? Run it, run it, run it. And I'm like, oh, perfect, I'm, I'm gonna make it. All of a sudden I come around the corner and what do I see? A, a sea of 
people in color. It's Chicago Marathon. And I'm looking at it now, the corner of State Street and Lake. And I'm like, oh my goodness, how am I getting to the NBC building there? And I'm the type of person, my mindset is if a wall comes up, I'll go around it, over it, or through it. And that's exactly what I did. So I literally, live show, I, I hopped over the gate that they had, and I'm running with the Chicago Marathon. I'm the only guy without a number on my chest, and it took me about a block and a half to kind of weave over running at an angle to get out, and I made it up to do the show. But... So you were running with the current of people. I was so running you down angrily, yes, I was, you know. And, and Brad, so the, the, those days, literally, show would end, jump in the car, not even. Show ends on the elevator ride down, phone calls are coming in, right, these leads. And my 45-minute car ride home, I'm working leads the whole ride. From the radio show, you literally just did. Did the show, phone's ringing, coming in. They're, they're hot, right? Strike while they aren't hot, so people are calling, and, and I would work those a whole ride home. Then I'd have it, I still have it in my phone, where it saves that old number, right? 800 line, it's, uh, you know, uh, radio lead, it's still in here. And in the early days, yeah, listen, it'd be a, I don't know, Sunday afternoon, throwing a ball with the kids. The kids were, you know, young, play with them outside, and all of a sudden, that phone rings, and... I had to do what I had to do, right? There's a lot of money spent on that radio. I'm in the early stages, don't want the business to fail. I'd literally have to, sadly, break from the kids, hi, and I'm running upstairs, and I got little guys trying to get the dad. I remember, Brad, I literally sometimes run in the master bedroom closet, and I'm holding the handle with one hand, so the kid's trying to open the door, dad, dad. And to sound, and I'm sticking my face in between suits. <laughs> So to, to talk to people because I didn't want them to hear the kids until my wife would grab them. So, yeah, in the beginning, it was seven days a week. But God's blessing and a, a tremendous amount of time, hard work, and grind uh, to a point that we then phased off from seven days a week to six to five. Then I did for many years. I was just Monday through Thursday mm -hmm. because I put myself in a position. As my, I have three sons. They all play ice hockey, okay? It's just a blessing and a curse. Um, it's fun, very demanding, but I got to a point where I built the business that I can actually be involved and not miss anything, you know, and to the point now that I've, I've moved to another state and the success we've uh, achieved, and, and you guys have been instrumental in that, you know, triad, you know, the company that you've helped us really build a business for scale that's not relying upon me that I'm now living, you know, in, in Tennessee and my main hub of companies here in Chicago mm -hmm. and uh, come back up, but that's not dependent upon me or relying upon me. We've grown a team of, you know, 26 and we're adding more, you know, frequently. So uh, appreciate your help with that. Yeah, it's been awesome to see. I mean, what's crazy is we had a whole decade run and most of that run, I didn't work directly with you, but we always, you know, whenever we saw each other at big events, we would, you know, catch up, give each other a hard time over the phone call. Oh, yeah. That, you know? Yeah. And, um, I mean, you've been at Triad two and a half years. Yep. And I'm going to, you wouldn't be normally the guy that would come on and say, I went from this to this to this. That's one of the things I love is you don't have an ego. You're not the guy that walks in the room saying, you know, look at my new sports car. Or Here's how much business I did. But just so the listeners can kind of hear the, the progress even in the last two and a half years, what's what's that look like as far as assets gathered? And then let's let's kind of pivot to what I kind of call the entrepreneurial lie. Yep. And how you started to disconnect from just grind, 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 more money, more more money in the bank account, more business versus that balance to where you were able to spend, I think, six, eight weeks in Nantucket last summer with your family and plug. So yeah. give me kind of the the growth trajectory the last few years, and then let's like cross the bridge of how did you grow, yep. but also create more freedom? Because I think that's the trade-off a lot of offices, a lot of advisors out there, like how do you do this? Yeah, yeah. Well, look, like many, right, I was just trying to continue to grow. And, you know, for a long time we were doing, you know, 25 million and then 30 and 40 and 50. And then you feel like you got to a level doing, 
I was doing 65 million, I believe, as an individual. And uh, I was watching other people starting to do more than me, but they had a team. So I stayed pretty prideful. I'll be, okay, well, they did more, but there's, you know, seven advisors. Right. I'm doing this with one. Foolish. Okay. So can't do everything yourself. And, and I worked really, really hard to the point where I got that up, brought on like a service advisor, okay, or two, and still everything was running through me, right? So I would uh, begin my day pretty much 10 a.m. and have back to back to back to back meetings and run out the door. Now I'm at a point where in the early days I would run out the door, set up my own seminars myself. People are waiting as I'm the guy that's putting up banner stands and setting up speakers and, you know, uh, got to a point where we hire people to do that. But nonetheless, all that stuff was relying upon me. 10 a.m., I'm working back to back to back to back meetings, walk, running out the door at 5.45 to go drive and do that, conduct the seminar, walk in the door, often 8.30, 8.45, 9 p.m., uh, just in time to read a book to one of my three boys or two of the boys say good night and then the morning started and it started all over again so brad i, I did that for years I mean, years and uh there's a lot of sacrifice that was made to you know to my family to do that and you think all right well i'm growing this business and sometimes the thing that you sought out to build becomes your biggest foe right because now i built this thing that was relying upon myself and I had a moment, company that I was working with back then, you know, this FMO, and I still I had incremental amounts of, of growth, right? And it kind of steadily did its thing, 30, 40, 50. But I was sacrificing me, right? My my time with my family, um, even my mind. It was like, gosh, can I continue to do this? Couldn't turn it off even. Couldn't turn it off. Yeah. You know, so Sometimes I'd find myself at, at dinner sitting there and yes, I'm physically present, but mentally I'm like, oh, what about this? Don't forget about this stuff. So everything was coming to me. The funnel came here and I got to a point, you know, maybe it's pride, um, not wanting to look bad, you know, but you don't want to see your production go backwards. And I did this for like a decade and I got to a point, I forgot that that year, I think we wrote a total of like 80, 87 or 91 million, 91 million. And I walk across the stage to get recognition, right? At a kind of beginning of year event, recognizing all you've done for the prior year. And I remember the six seconds that I spent on stage, got recognized, I walked off. And literally I walked off the stage, walked to the bathroom, used the restroom and then I, I kind of splashed a little water in my face, took a moment, and literally, I, I had to look myself in the mirror moment, true story. And I'm at this uh, Las Vegas casino hotel, I look in the mirror, I'm like, I'm not going to do that again. I'm not going to spend an entire year almost killing myself with the constant grind to get to a point. So, okay, so I finished it, the, this, you know, in the top 10 or five, whatever it is, I don't want to do that. It's not fair to me and my family. I even said to myself, how many people in that room of 3,000, 4,000 people sitting here? I go down tomorrow. How many of those people really care if they're coming to my own funeral? Yeah. You know, and I had a moment. I said, going forward, this is about my family, right? This is about me. I'm going to change the direction. And I, I needed help doing that. And that's one of the things you do, again, were instrumental in uh, helping me build a business that I started to take everything off of me. Remember, I shared a story, pivotal moment at the end, where my grandmother, uh -huh. 89 years of age, I was visiting her, and you know, you have people in your life that will tell you like it is, right? Yeah. Straight shooters. The ones that truly love you. The ones that truly love you, right? Yeah. And my grandmother being one of those people, she's like, Anthony, you look, you look tired. You know, you look a little drawn. How's everything going? I'm like, I'm fine. I'm working a lot, but I'm fine. And she's like, ah, I'm a little worried about you. I'm like, Graham, don't worry about me. I'm, I'm a machine. I got, I'm a machine. And she said, yeah, well, machines break. Mm -hmm. So I had a little light bulb moment to say, you know what? She's right. 
you know, and, and I can't keep this pace. So that's when I said, I have to do something. And I didn't know how, how do I scale? How do I, how do I remove myself and train and teach others and have them do the other things where it's not so reliant upon me? And how much is the business of 91 million going to go backwards to suffer in order for me to take a, a massive step backwards to have that giant leap forward. Well, uh, with scaling and everything we put together with, with your help, I put us, ourselves in a position then that we went from uh, 91 million to 171 million year over year with me doing a lot less of the production, relying on others, building the team. The following year, though, we went from 171 to about 210 million. And of that, I've written zero. So I completely removed myself. And this year, we're pacing north of 250 million. While, by the grace of God, living in one state, business in another. And to your point, yeah, we uh, bought a, an amazing investment property, uh, second home in Nantucket. So my family now, we look forward to taking. Last couple of years, we're taking six to eight weeks in the summer there. And the business is now, you know, running as a machine that's, that, I don't, I think I had two or three phone calls the entire, you know, six to eight weeks. So that's, that's where we're at, but it didn't happen overnight. Man, I didn't want to interrupt any of that. Um, there's so much wisdom in what you just shared. And there's a reason the new show is called Do Business, Do Life. There's a reason that that's the biggest mission we're on at Triad, because it's guys like you that have been lifelong friends, I guess, decade plus. Well, it's not money. Yeah. We were the right way to teach us, right? Yeah. I met that, uh, that card shop back in the day, I would have given you better advice. Maybe we'll get to that story too. Mm -hmm. But um, one of the things this mission, why it's so close to my heart and why I like, at Triad, we call it the infinite game. It's the game that you never stop playing. Because when is business too good and when is life too good? When you've got that balance right. Yeah. And I, I've seen, unfortunately, a lot of stories like you where you were like the golden boy. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that for you. You were like the golden boy. It was like, here's this guy, young, good looking, well spoken. And that story of looking in the mirror after what should have been a pinnacle in yeah. your career. Yes. Instead, it was the pinnacle of burnout. Yes and grinding and missing family dinners and sporting events and all of that. And the truth is, if you build it right with the proper structure, you don't have to do this tug of war between grow my business, sacrifice my life, or grow my freedom in my life and sacrifice my business and go backwards to your yeah. point. So let's go into, um, and by the way, such stellar advice from your grandma. Like like how, how much wisdom was in Machines break. Yeah. Two, two words. Two words. Two words. And it was like a slap upside the head. Colored from someone who loved you more than anything. Yeah. And it's like, okay. And she trained. You know, I, can't, I couldn't sustain that trajectory. And I never thought it was, I thought, okay, you can either have, because people talk about having a growth style business or a lifestyle business. Right. Which one do you want? Yeah. I never thought. It was possible, and even if I believed it could be possible, I didn't know how. How do I have both? Is it possible to have both, right? And how do you get there? What is the recipe? What is the roadmap, right? The architecture look like to make that happen. And again, the most challenging part is even if you have that, oh, here's what the roadmap is, but if you're already running out of pace, you've built this machine, right? That's doing 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 million in business, how much is that going to suffer for me to, to take off? So, um, but I follow that advice and, and here we are. Yeah, that's the, it's, I've heard the analogy. It's like trying to build a car while you're driving 70 miles an hour down the highway. You know, it's like you were trying to rebuild the car while you're running. Yes. It's incredibly fast. Yeah. Uh, but there's a few things there that I pull out. Number one, you set your ego aside. You, yes. you said, and, and I think the really tough thing I see this industry for most advisors probably listening in, you are the survivor, right? You came into your captive group, maybe you transitioned like Anthony did from a different industry, but you know there were 20, 50, 100 in your opening class of advisors and 
the reality is like it's less than a five percent success rate yes and all of it is based on your individual performance because it's like i gotta market i gotta do my seminars i gotta do my appointments oh wait New business? Well, shoot, I guess I'll fill out paperwork too in the early days. This was. You're doing it all. Yep. And it's, I call it becoming a victim of your own success because now you're so busy because you've actually marketed well. You're, you're helping and serving people. So they're now becoming clients. Now you're creating this service work that you yes. didn't have the first couple of years. Yep. And what's, what's the hardest part I've seen of that individualized success versus team based success? It's a completely different skill set to be a great salesperson versus a great business owner mm. and then great CEO. Agreed. And there's no financial advisor playbook, yeah. which is why we're creating one, by the way, yeah. and, you know, the four phases of scale. But what if you go back, let's say that inflection point of this won't only be Anthony. I've got to remove that constraint. Maybe it was after this talk to yourself in the mirror. And you were to give advice to the listeners out there like, hey, here was the first action I did or the first mindset shift that I had to start to go in a different direction where I could grow my business and it not all be on my shoulders. What what would be some tips that you'd give? Well, first, when you're growing that quickly, right, mm -hmm. uh, and that volume, you're right. You have to serve. You look behind you and say, okay, now we have this marketing machine coming, people, but uh, hey, you've got you know, 4,000, 4,500 clients here that need to be serviced or you're going to be losing a bunch of people, mm -hmm. right? So I knew we had to hire the right talent. And if you hire the right people, I mean, success is inevitable, right? You bring in good people, train them up, love on them, mentor them, you know, put your, your team at, at the top. And so I would say that's the first thing, getting people great advisors to service our existing clients, you know, um, and then removing myself from all those other daily tasks, right? So someone shared a, a great book with me years ago, and it was called The One Thing. And I think you're familiar with oh, it. Oh, yeah. Gary Keller. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So he's somebody who should get on the show. You should get him on yeah. the show. So that was something else that, and truth be told, Brett, I never read the damn book. <laughs> I, I never I read the damn book. This, this doesn't, <laughs> right? Because I'm running so hard, I don't even have time to read it. But what the, the, the overview is explained, hey, take everything else off of you and just focus on the one thing that, that you love most, that you're passionate, that you're best at, and, and basically sub out everything else. And that's when you can thrive. Mm -hmm. So that's what I did. So I said, okay, without reading the book, is that I, I get that mindset. So if I can have service advisors and, and planning department and this, that, and remove all these things from myself to the point where I don't even emails, right? I don't even read an email. Mm -hmm. Nothing's coming to me. And that freed me up to just basically focus on rainmaking. I, I, I went from hating seminars and burnout to fall in love with them again, because all I'm doing now, I'm focusing on filling our advisors' calendars, you know, uh, making sure our team's servicing their clients, building that out, serve, 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 serve. And I find joy in watching our advisors thrive in their own lives. As a result of many of those appointments coming to me, they're going to them. So they get to prosper and grow. And uh, basically between TV, you know, radio, workshops, educational events, client uh, uh, educational events for clients too, not just the general public, but all these different things. I enjoy doing that and I've taken everything else off of me and that's where I'm passionate on. Well, let's go down that path. I think that's super helpful if, if there's an advisor out there and if, regardless of where they're at, maybe they're early on and they're in that grind phase, which by the way, I think for pretty much any business and I've Two and a half years of the startup at Triad, yeah. there's definitely been a grind phase. Yes. Right? Yeah. Now we have 55 team members, so there's starting to be a foundation of a business. But early days when there was two or three or four of us looking at each other, it's like, uh, this is overwhelming. Sure. So, right. or, you know, maybe you're an advisor in that spot. Maybe you're an advisor that hit that 30, 40, 50, 60 million. Now it's like you kind of created your own prison around yourself, like yeah. you were talking about. Or maybe you've actually started to scale a team and you've got multiple advisors. I think what's interesting that you've kind of started to tiptoe into 
So we coach on three businesses within a business. You've got marketing, so that's before mm -hmm. the client acquisition. You've got sales, which is during. Yep. And by the way, sales is not a bad word to me. It's a transfer of beliefs and helping people. So yeah. those of you out there that hear sales and like, you know, get a little squeamish, that's what how we define it here. And then ops is take care and love yes. on the clients, right? So before, during, after. Yes. What I heard you say is essentially you fired yourself from the during, which was the appointments. Yes. You fired yourself from anything operational and you really refocused into your desire zone versus your drudgery zone, which is I like the one to many marketing. Sometimes that's called a rainmaker or manufacturing appointments for the team. And now you actually add more value to your firm yes. because that's your focus, which by the way, we're getting into kind of live presentations a little bit, but you're one of the most gifted presenters I've ever seen in the space. Well, thank you. But now you're manufacturing appointments. So for those advisors out there that are thinking, oh, I hate seminars, oh, I've another evening, you kind of shifted the mindset of now I have no appointments during the day. Yep. Now my presentation days, I actually have I believe you have more scheduled family time oh. in the mornings. Yes. Sometimes you even do spa treatments, I think. And you're like, <laughs> do you do that or am I making that up? Nah, it's not, not, I, sometimes I'll get a good massage once in a while and I get a horrible neck and shoulder. So yeah, I'll see that. But but now you've re re uh, organized your day to really enjoy presentation days. Yes. Thrive. And so let's go through that shift. How did you? Was it just like you jumped in and said, we'll figure it out? Did you slowly ease yourself out of appointments so that you could focus on the presentations? How did that evolve? Uh, well, here, I, I will tell you, the mindset started with uh, you brought in one of the, the partners that you work with, Michael Hyatt. Yeah. Incredibly gifted, talented individual, right, on, on business building. And, and, and he said, you know, yesterday, you can empower your team and step aside and watch it grow. So I took that mindset. I'm like, okay, that's exactly what I'm going to do. And if you uh, overpay even for the right people. So if you're paying 10%, 15%, even 20% above market to attract good people, good people want to be a part of a thriving business. And if I'm willing to Look, you can't just be cheap and steal people, right? So you you have to be willing to step up. And we did. So we overpaid to get the right people. Now my confidence went up to say, okay, I've got A-plus players that we're bringing in here. And as your business grows and evolves, you may outgrow people, right? Mm -hmm. So, and then you get to a point, it's like, okay, well, you know what? Can I reposition this person for someone, for another position within the firm? Or can they still play a role? And if not, sometimes... Unfortunately, you outgrow, but we have to right, you have to keep evolving. So I think it was that mindset of bringing in A plus players only, step aside, watch it grow, and I didn't. Uh, I made that transformation relatively quickly, right? Because that's the only way you can go, you know, from ninety to one hundred and seventy one million year over year, uh, is is to really. I was dedicated. I was committed. Well, it, it also is the lesson of when you focus. I'm guessing when you were torn half between, like you're doing a 12, 15 hour day because you run appointments all day and then you've got a seminar that evening. You're exhausted at that point oh, yeah. to where it's almost like a laser. You focus the energy. It can cut through anything. You removed yourself. Now you can dive full focus into the marketing aspect. My guess is your marketing evolved tremendously to manufacture more prospects for those advisors where had you been, you know, a foot on each side, yep. there's no way you would have even had the energy. Yes. Yes. Truth be told, I try that. No. So there was a uh, great partners of ours and some of closest friends, right? SHP, mm -hmm. Financial out of Boston, and they are saying, hey, Anthony, here's a kind of a, a roadmap, so to speak, that we've been utilizing. And I was, I, I had like one foot in the door working their process and the other foot was still doing what made us successful to begin with. And 
it was a struggle. Which, which for those maybe not familiar, it kind of came from a very, what I'd call sales heavy organization that was kind of do the seminar, sell the product, as opposed to more of a holistic financial planning process, a little more intense yes. as far as like the work involved. Yeah. And so you were kind of doing this in between. Yes. So what did that create? Or, or like looking back, what advice would you give yourself now? Uh, <laughs> the advice I would give myself was don't dabble, right? A foot in each side here, just go all in. And instead of tugging at the band-aid, rip the damn thing off all at once quickly because I, I danced for maybe, you know, a year and a half, mm -hmm. about two years of, and I, I got to a point where I'm like, no, no, just go all in. And once it became laser focused and went all in, uh, that's, you know, what, what helped. And uh, it was like a rocket ship from there. And, and back to what you were saying too about, you know, my, my routine now. In the, the earlier days, when I, I lived in Illinois, eight minutes from the office, and now to a point where we moved to, to Tennessee and the company's here. Now, thank God it's only an hour in the air, right? So it's a quick flight. And now I'm, I'm coming up, I may come up two days a week, sometimes three days, sometimes one day. And it may be every other week. Mm -hmm. And my wife, right? I was just talking to her about that. I'm like, honey, you know, is this hard for you that I can go up to Chicago for, you know, two or three days? and. And she's like, to be honest with you, you're way more present now than you were then. And I love the opportunity that we can spend the mornings together. Maybe we can work out together. We can catch up on stuff together. And I will get up, breakfast with the kids in the morning, drive my, my youngest is uh, eight. I drive him to school. My older guys, uh, my oldest just started driving. It's crazy. But uh, I'll go. When I'm home, I drop, drive them to school, pick them up from school, go to football practice, hockey practice, right? So it's, even though, again, two separate states, I'm way more present, have way more time now with the family than, than I ever had previously. But yeah. that's also by design, mm -hmm. right? Uh, even that was a challenge though, right? I remember calling you. Remember I called you, I called Derek and Sean, right when I sold my home here. I'm like, guys, and I'm having a moment. I'm like, oh my goodness, I, I built this business, a lot of success my entire life, and I, it's real now because we sold it. I moved there, didn't know what to ex expect, but I, I trusted the process, what we built, and uh, it's worked out. Yeah, and that, that was, I mean, that was a massive life change, not just a business change. I'm born and raised Chicago. Yeah. It, it wasn't like you moved to Chicago and built a business, like you grew up here. Yeah. Um, 45, 46 years. Yeah, I want to I want to hit on something because uh, I've always, besides the business success, I've always admired Anthony, the husband and dad, and just one of the reasons we just became friends so quickly, like you were just authentic, you were real, you didn't walk into, I mean, if anybody deserved to have an ego walk in the room, your production would have warranted it had, had that, you know, been a thing for you, but it never was. Yeah. And uh, when we talk about do business, do life, that's both sides of the equation. Yeah. And I, we've spent a lot of hours just talking about what it means to be a better dad. Yeah. Because right? like your oldest is 15, just 16, 16. 16. Yeah. And my oldest is 12 now. Yeah. Boy, does it fly. Um, so let's talk about that because I do, I see it a lot. And I was fortunate when I got in this business, I was 26. Yeah. And because the way finance works, the, the running joke is it's a bunch of old white guys, right? It's, it's, it's getting more diversity, but it's not there yet. But that was my clientele when I started. And they were all probably averaging 45, 55, 65. Yep. And I remember our oldest was born. So I was 30. I actually hadn't turned 30. I was 29. And the advice I kept getting from my clients, soak it in. Yes. This will go so fast. It'll be gone in the blink of an eye. And all of it sounds so cliche. Yes. Everything changes when you become a parent, all of those things. But the truth is everything does change yeah. when you become a parent. And now I'm so thankful because I was kind of like, it was drilled into me at a young age, like, don't take this for granted. Don't miss sports games. Don't make family diet, you know, make family dinner a priority, all yeah. of that. But I've also seen this business. It doesn't turn off as amazing as finance it is. It's, it can eat you alive if you allow it to. And so if you were going to 
like let's just say you're talking to a dad out there um maybe share the white the white tea story because that, that one hits home to me yeah and you've got little ones and if you can get like pass some of that wisdom down to that next generation or like guys that have kids our age where it's like hey it's never too late to change the path you're going down but what advice would you give there on like that how hard it was to balance you're building this business for them but if it steals your time and you don't actually get to see them yeah it's like the worst trade-off in the world so just speak to that if you don't mind a absolutely and for, for me brad my look god made me this way right i'm a driven type a personality drive drive so you have to be careful i think you have to be really conscious of that because i was running hard in doing that seven days and at six and five and over time but uh I, I had this some of the justification of me working hard and doing that was justified oh, i'm doing this for family right i'm doing it for this family and i i'd say to myself when my kids were five and six and six and seven because uh, my first two were 15 months apart then the young guy came later about six seven year gap and i'd say i'm grinding 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 okay they're four and five five and six six and seven and i'd say okay I'm going to do this to the half point, which is when they hit eight mm. or nine, nine, because I said, okay, by first nine years I'm going because then I've got nine years left with them in my home before off to school. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to build this business to what then the first night and then the next night will be a lot more time shared, justifying it that way. Well, I blinked my eyes and all of a sudden I'm like, wait, you know, my son's 12 then he's 13. And then it went the other way. I'm like, wait, I only have three years left to right? two and a half years left. So that shocked me because like you, I, I feel very, very fortunate and blessed that I had a lot of clients would share their wisdom. Anthony, it's going to go quick, enjoy it. And it was like one year out the other. Oh yeah, yeah. You felt like invincible. You had nothing but time. And then all of a sudden your kids are 16, 15, got to the eye. So uh, speaking to somebody who's doing it with the younger kids now, it's just, uh, just force the balance, you know, force the balance. Just the business, if you structure it the right way, you don't have to be, you know, the business isn't so reliant and dependent upon you. If you structure it the right way, structure it the right way early and just make the time, make the balance. I think, Brad, that's probably part of the reason now why I've got a freshman and a sophomore and, um, you know, I've got whatever, really, if you, you think about it, two to three summers left with my oldest before they're off to school. That's why I am taking the last couple of years, six weeks, eight weeks off in the Nantucket holidays, another two to four weeks. So I, I looked at it and there's basically three months out of the year that I'm family, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I'm, I'm making up for those early years. So, but uh, just get ahead of it and face it at a younger age and then. Yeah, I, that's my favorite part about your journey is you've grown a business and unlocked more freedom for you and your family. I mean that, and I think that is the entrepreneurial dream is yes. build a business that serves your life. Unfortunately, oftentimes you build a business that becomes your life yes. as an entrepreneur. Yes. Um, as we think through, I want to go to that, that last little piece you touched on. Um, well, we didn't hear the white tees. The white tees? Yeah. Okay. Tell, tell me that, because I think that'll hit home with some people. Yeah. So, look, I, I early on, I ditched ties, right? I'm like, ah, I don't want a tie. I, I like this look and feel. It's, you know, so meeting with clients, relaxed, but still professional, right? So no tie. So, you know, I wear a white V-neck T-shirt. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, by the way, anyone watching this, please, please, if you're, if you're wearing dress shirts, don't wear the traditional white t-shirt then when you can <laughs> see it coming out please don't do that right i see it, i'm like oh please stop you know so early <laughs> by the way for those that don't know based on the last name pellegrino anthony's italian has a dress in impeccable from the day i've met him and so you're getting some serious fashion tips here so yeah please it, it, it's in the bloodline yeah. his grandfather that was a, a truck driver you know he literally drove a truck and worked on docks yet he dressed impeccably just well. People thought he was a mob boss. They was like, he's not really a truck driver. No, he is, but that's how he dressed. So it's in the blood. But uh, I would wear a white V-neck 
t-shirt under, so you can't see it, right? Mm -hmm. And basically, you know, my kids, uh, if I was, you know, in the morning when they were young, and I'm leaving, and they'd say, no, white, no, white t-shirt, white t-shirt, white t-shirt. And I'm like, I don't know what the heck they're talking about, right? And then when I come home from the office, the first thing they'd be is white t-shirt. Now I'd find myself on, let's say, a Sunday, right? I'm home after radio stuff, and I'd put on a Nike t-shirt, right? And my kids would say, no, 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 white t-shirt, white t-shirt. Brad, it didn't hit me till years later. Years later, I'm like, what the hell? What's their thing about the white t-shirt? Well. Then it hit me. It's like son of a gun. The the last thing they saw me wearing in mom home before I left, because I had my white t-shirt on, do stuff, then I'd throw on my dress shirt over it, leave. Mm -hmm. And when I come home, the first thing when I get home, I take that off and I see the white t-shirt. So to they hit me like son of a gun. To them little kids, that white t-shirt meant dad's still home. Mm -hmm. So that, you know is one of the reasons I think that I've, uh, you know, I carve out the time. Uh, and, and again, now, incredibly blessed because I, I really, really get to spend a lot of time. You know, I was telling you, uh, it's it's a blessing and it occurs with hockey, but literally from Labor Day to second week of December, almost every weekend for three and a half months straight, I was in a different city with one of my boys and hockey tournaments everywhere and just tons of bonding time and it's 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 awesome be, being able to build a business that affords you opportunity to really connect and be with your your kids and and i've learned some great things from our community mm -hmm. right with with triad the whole do business do life i had a text thread going this morning with one of the advisors who uh chris bowman sent me a text and uh i shot back to him can i share yeah i might so he sent me a message and, uh, you know, basically saying, hey, man, you look forward to, to seeing you soon and talking. I appreciate some of the stuff we're doing. And, and I said to him, he, he thanked me for some stuff I, I did for him recently or, or, or shared with. And I shot back and said, hey, listen, thank you for some of the things you've done for me. He, he had this part of his, uh, for this year, it says, our children get one shot at childhood. It's what we make of it for them. Mm -hmm. I want to be more present. Shep, we're on video here. Show that to the camera because I want it to be captured on the... Uh... Yeah, so it's, for me, it's, it's not just about being in a business industry where we can have iron sharpen iron and get better and make more and produce more. It's, I want to be in an environment with like-minded people, you know, um, maybe dads, yeah. similar thinking, family people. And uh, I'm like, listen, some of the business stuff I help you with, I say, you have any idea how that one thing you said, what you wrote down is stuck with me and resonated. And I'll remind myself of that. I mean, kids get one shot at childhood. It's what we make of it for them. Be more present. I mean, so that is the epitome of do business, do life. And what's cool about that, that was one of the champagne moments mm. from the, the, so one of the things we did, and I don't even remember where this came to be, we were talking, so the champagne moment, and that's whether you enjoy a glass of champagne or maybe it's sparkling grape juice, whatever your thing is, but something with bubbles that pops a cork, <laughs> right? Yeah, that's a celebration. It sure is. And uh, this year it was really cool. Um, like one of those pinch me moments to see our community both do a do business champagne moment, which is great. Hey, we're running businesses. You should be going for growth. And, yeah, yeah. and you know, we'll bring on more assets, growing the team, but not at the expense of life. And so we also did a do life champagne moment. And uh, it was just some of the most inspiring stuff. We had a couple community members that they were, they're going to drop 60 pounds this year. Wow. And I'm like, yeah. With what's all the money in the world matter if you don't have your health? Yeah, right. Yeah. And so it was super inspiring. Um, I want to hit something because you're now talking a bit about the community and one of the things that Triad we wanted to do. I don't want this to be a Triad commercial. This is just yes. us, us sharing life, right? I, absolutely. But one of the things that we try to do really intentionally is obviously we're working with top performers, but growth minded, do business, do life sort of people. I want our experiences. We don't do events. We do experiences because I want my kids hanging around guys like you 
as my buddy Jim Shields says, the family board meeting, yeah. and I know we've both benefited from that, he says, he tried to, to create environments for his children and for his family to where the fun uncle, yeah. like I will tell you, they, my kids hear a lot from dad to where there's the point of, oh yeah, dad, we've heard that before. Yeah. But Anthony, the dude from Chicago, Nashville, you know, that's a yeah. good time, he's cool, he's wearing yeah. a nice Italian jacket, probably some Ferragamos, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and when you say something, by the way, it could be the exact same thing that I share with them, but it's like, oh, okay, fun uncle, Anthony, Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll do some push-ups in the morning or, you know, I'll read yeah, that book. Totally. And that selfishly is one of, like, the coolest things about this community is just great, not only advisors, top performers, but great humans yeah. that I just want to be around. And so for me, it doesn't feel like work. Yeah. It feels like, oh, the Founders Retreat this summer in Lake Tahoe, that's going to be fun. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And our, by the way, our families will be there because yes. as an entrepreneur, like, it should be your choice. You know, do you want to bring your whole crew? Awesome. Do you want to just do a little getaway with your spouse? Cool. You want to do a business retreat? Cool. Come solo. But it's your choice. That's not like for us to define. Yes. And so I want to get to something you actually coined a term in our community. Yeah. It takes a village or a triad. We say it takes a pack. Well, yeah. And, and we run as a pack. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. so I'm going to set this up, but I want you to share your... Um, kind of the mindset and what led to this. So we had, unfortunately, we had a, a community member joined a Scott put in a tough situation. He had to move $200 million of assets in a 60 day period, like literally repaper everybody. And it was really unfortunate and kind of got thrown a little curve, curve ball on the way out the door. And um, Sean, I believe called you, this was like dinner time, six, 6.30 at night. Close. It was, <laughs> it, it was, it was almost worse. It was, it was, uh, this was a Friday afternoon and it was like 4 41 PM. Uh, I just picked the boys up from practice after school. I had practice. I just picked them up. I think I had two of the three boys in the car and, uh, literally it was 4 41 PM on, on a Friday. And, uh, he said, Hey, you know, we have a situation going on visor joined a team coming over with us and he's in a position with uh, I think TD Ameritrade and Charles Schwab. Yeah. Right. We're, we're in there um, kind of. It was in the merger. Yeah. The, the squared in happening. between merger where you couldn't get a direct sort of relationship or something. Yes. Basically or TD was saying nope you can't open any new RIAs on our platform. You have to go through Schwab. And that created a problem because that advisor of 210 billion had his money with uh, TD. Yep. Those clients were through TD, but it was like through a different company, right? So they stopped. Nope, can't do it. So then Sean's like, you know, what are you thinking? You know, you think you can help? He knew that I had some relationships and contacts at TD Ameritrade Institutional. Uh, great, great people, great relationships. And then, you know, it's Friday afternoon. He's like, I don't know, we'll, we'll think about it and come up with a plan and we'll hit it next week. And I'm like, no, no, no. Let's do this now. And he's like, now? I'm like, yeah, let's do it now. And then, uh, and I, I, it just flew off the tip of my tongue. I said, uh, I say, I try it. We, we run as a pack. And that kind of stuck, right? We, hey, we run as a pack. Let's do it. So we ended up, I called a guy in TD Ameritrade, one of our uh, relationships patched, uh, Sean and I run. We patched in the other person, the advisor, and uh, Zach, and then we, worked it together and sure enough they they pushed it through and made it happen yeah so he had ended up being able to still open the new RIA through TD Ameritrade Institutional not going through Schwab they pushed that through and it saved them a ton of English to have to go back to all those clients sorry you have to you know repaper over to Schwab so yeah I just remember we felt pretty helpless um because he was put in a tough spot and I remember Sean, Sean's version of the story telling me I was on the call, but he basically said, Hey, Anthony, so sorry. I know it's like getting into family time. And then immediately with zero hesitation, you're like, Hey, to try it, we run as a pack. Yeah. And what that tell, I mean, if you're listening in that number one tells you a ton about Anthony, just the way he carries himself, he's there to serve, um, there to help others. But that, that for us, I think was a pivotal moment at triad 
I mean, this was, you know, over a year ago now, and it reinforced what we wanted to build, which was a community that felt a lot more small, intimate, boutique, a lot more like a mastermind than a brokerage firm, yep. you know? And you said that, and then I, I noticed it became like a mantra in our in our headquarters in Lawrence. It was like the tribe we run as a pack. It was like it's almost like Mel Gibson, Braveheart, you know, riding around on a horse, flat the yeah. flag, and the Patriot. It, and but then it started to become a mantra when the advisors were talking to each yeah. other. Yes. And they started to feel like I'm part of something here and it's different. We're changing an industry. It's not just about production. We're, we're trying to build businesses that create more freedom. And one of the things, as I looked, you mentioned the kind of award, the typical industry award ceremonies, parade across stage, here's how much production you did, next, all that. What I found is, is those things got really big. Like, I remember being at those. Yeah. And then people would be in the back and they're yawning and they're like three or four hours. I'm like, Let's never recreate this again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I'm all for recognition, but what we did, and I'm going to give you credit, we said, hey, what if we created like really meaningful awards for our community that embody what we're about? And I'm super, uh, it was really cool. It was fun this year. We created the Run as a Pack Award at Triad. We gave one away in January. You were the recipient. Yes. Zach was the recipient because... It was a perfect example of somebody, number one, you can't give help to somebody that doesn't ask. And Zach's like, hey, I don't know what to do, guys. Like, I'm in over my head here. And to have a community member like you raise your hand and say, hey, I'm here to serve. How can I help? And try to be around as a pack. And we created this award. You each got one this year. But more importantly, you got a really cool T-shirt. T-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. You guys must have found that uh, somewhere out, I don't know, in like Sedona, it's in the, Arizona hey, or something, the, with the wolf howling at it. For those that remember The Office, where yeah. Dwight wears the the shirt with three wolves howling at the moon, it's the infamous Howl at the Moon t-shirt. It can be purchased on Amazon. It's got magical powers. Yes, yeah. Amazon probably brought three ninety nine, right? To, oh, it's, it's an expensive Come on. It's, it's under it's 10. A, no, no, it's under, no, no, no. They cranked the price up. It, it, by, by the way, funny story of that, that evening that we received the award and I got the t-shirt the infamous t-shirt all signed look the t-shirt was missing and very close friend to both of us right Derek Gregoire all of a sudden look Derek went stole the shirt changed and he had it under his sport coat and he's wearing it around thinking that he's like I deserve the wolf t-shirt the run is a pack award so man uh, the running joke that piece of work because we were supposed to be dressed club chic Yes. And you know, yeah. growing up in Kansas, was, nobody, I don't know what it yeah. is still. Yeah. But Derek pulled it off, I think. He had a sport coat with a, a wolf t shirt underneath. So that's my <laughs> new definition. Close. A, a stolen <laughs> wolf t shirt, you know. Hey, but you know, going back to something too, like, yes, of course I want to help. And that's the mindset. The the other part of that is uh I don't know, I kinda I grew up obsessed with I grew up during the Michael Jordan era, mm -hmm. right? In Chicago. So I was obsessed with Jordan and truth be told, I, I don't mind. I like being told no, no, you can't do something. No, you can't achieve this. You can't. I like that. Jordan had a phenomenal commercial uh, towards the end of his career where he, it's like slow motion. He's talking. He's like, tell me I'm bad. Tell me I'm no longer good enough. Tell me I'm old. And then the, as he's the, saying that he jumps from the free throw line and dunks and he's like 37 at that age or something. And he's like, tell me I'm too old. I, I can tell me I can no longer fly. I want you to. So I developed that mindset in, in business and in life where, again, I'm going to figure out a way, right? So that's something else about me where I always, I, I need to feel challenged, mm -hmm. right? Like it, it being told, nope, you can't do it. No, you guys can't achieve this. No, you can't do that. That's what drives me. Part of it. Well, I've seen it. Well, hey. You can't get to your live radio show without going through the Chicago Marathon. You, you yes. Found, you found the way. Yes. Yeah. And you, by the way, you know my passion for Jordan, and you also gave me gave me a little bit of crap that uh, I made the mistake of all mistakes back in the day. We okay. Let's let's go there. Yeah. We're, we've got time, so yeah. let, let's. I'm going to brag on you a little bit. Um, I've been. So let's see, got in this business 07. So what is it, 2020? So what, 14th year in the, in the industry? Yes. And 
they say never to do math publicly. So I just, I, I made a mistake. I think it was, I think it's my 14th year. Yeah. So 14, 15, somewhere around there, decade and a half ish for you. And one of the things that was really cool growing up in the distribution model that I did, it was world-class direct response marketers, whether it was live events, radio, TV, it was people that knew how to manufacture appointments, not just sit here in their office waiting for a referral to walk in. So a lot of that was watching public events, dinner seminars. And I would guess I've watched a hundred plus at this point in my career live. A lot of them, some of them recorded. And I had the opportunity actually not that long ago to watch yours. And no, no, inf I'm not exaggerating. One of the most gifted uh, presenters I've seen. And that. you're a student. And one of the, there's a, like a few things I've seen you do that a lot of advisors struggle with. Number one, it's this authenticity that's just like, I feel like you're talking to like in your family room, to a group of people. Yeah. Um, the other thing I've shared with you is just the how. And I know you've got a philosophy. It's not really as much what you say. It's kind of the, the connection piece with the audience. And you very intentionally try to focus on so much connection in your live presentations. And part of that is this authenticity and this connection is your personal story, which kind of involves that Michael Jordan story. So I don't want you to put all of your secrets out on the internet, Yeah. but if we kind of talk like maybe high level, how you open yeah. with a really personal story, but also shares a lesson, I think there's just so much that advisors could learn from your different style to how you present. It's not about spreadsheets and math and although you hit on some of that, it's that connection and authenticity that almost like attracts the audience to want to lean in and learn more. Yes. So, sorry, I gave you a lot, really big lead up, but what, like, just kind of what are your thoughts around that that you've learned over the years? Well, I think, if look, it's when you walk into a room, you know, you have to have the mindset that my main goal of this is, I say to myself, connect, connect, connect. Because when you're in the financial industry, you, you gain a, a plethora of knowledge and information over the years and it's constantly growing right with all the financial stuff so you have to be careful you walk into a room i call it verbal vomit right where you just go in and spew all the knowledge you have and hope you've impressed them that you're so knowledgeable that they raise their hand or submit and say okay i should meet with you right and the opposite can happen you can actually overwhelm them confuse them and i have a saying where confused minds say no so if you come in and, and just be yourself and speak uh, genuinely, authentically, connect, but there's a lot of things too that I, I don't know, I just, you just be yourself, but there's time pauses, right? Maybe you're making a real point and instead of just r racing through the next thing, sometimes that silence for a moment to, to let it hang and marinate for a moment can really drive the point home. You know, eye contact, communication, getting other people involved, really walking into the room, connecting with them um, is a lot. And I'll, I'll tell you, like more, one of the speaking coaches I've worked with over the years uh, in the past, you know, talks about in the room, you often have the analytical thinker and then there's the emotional thinker and decision, decision maker, right? And often that is a couple, mm -hmm. and a husband and wife, they're one or the other. So it's like, if you come in, you're really just analytical, you just alienated half of the room. Same on the other side, you can't come in there just speaking to emotion. So I think you have to begin with some type of personal story, something that is, is personal about yourself. And if you can connect with them authentically, show who you really are to be vulnerable and you, you connect on the emotional side, then you get into some of the analytical, not too about, but understandable, but enough that you show competence, um, you know, comfort, all that together. And then at the end, right, you should also end on the note of on that emotional side, because then what happens is you're reminding them at the end of why they liked you right off the bat. So you're connecting on the emotional, filling the middle with a lot of 
uh, still some humor, right? Mm -hmm. But at the end, if you're ending on that emotional, it, it ties it back together. Thanks for sharing all that. And mm -hmm. you, you, how many presentations at this stage of your career do you think you've done? Oh my goodness. And at this point, probably over a thousand, you know? So, so it's kind of the old Malcolm Gladwell, 10,000 hours. Oh yeah. And, and so this has obviously been an evolution. One of the things, cause we talked about being growth minded, you actually have this little personal habit you do, which is as soon as a, one of your seminars is over, you hop in, you drive home, you actually cut an audio to yourself. Yep. So it's share that because I think that might, a lot of people be like, oh, he's done a thousand of these, 2000, however many in yep. your career, you'd be like, okay, I'm going to kind of dial it in. I got this thing figured out. But one of the learnings from you is you are constantly critiquing yourself. Yep. You're constantly going back and saying, oh, tonight felt a little off. Share share that if you don't mind. Yeah. Well, here and, and by the way, if you whether you're someone that's done a thousand of them or five thousand, whatever, um, or even a couple hundred, the problem there that can actually hurt you more than help you because if you've done a thousand, and let's say you're a guy that does two, three, five, six seminars in a month, eight in a month, whatever that is, you could actually literally sound like a white up down. Yeah. Right. And now you're just mentally, you've got the whole thing, everything you're saying, you're just going through the motions, going through the motions. Well, guess what? The people feel that they can read that. They sense that. And going to back to what you said, my mindset, it's not just what you say. It's how you say it. It's how it's delivered. And you know, are, are you not just likable? Are you believable? Right. Do you mean what you're saying? You shouldn't want to try to sell people. No. Really, it's it's having conviction, right? In in I'm selling. A, this is what I believe. I believe this so much that there's a transfer of beliefs that happens, right? Where um, it's not I'm trying to sell anyone. No, right. this is me. This is what I believe. I'm. I have conviction. I have passion about it. And if you like what we do, then we're leaders, and we're going to help lead you. So that's that's kind of a mindset um, there. And what I will do to your point, Brad. I'll remind myself before I go in, connect, connect, connect. Remind myself, do not speak at them, speak with them. So it's almost like an open conversation style. And you know, you'll see it because you'll see people when you're saying something, you know, they'll lean in. You see a lot of head nodding. You see them engaged. So, um, and to your point, to this day, I don't care if I've done, you know, spoken over a thousand times. To this day, if I walk out and I know we had really good success, great results, what I do immediately, I get in the car on my drive back home or what have you, I'll hit the record button on my phone. And as I'm driving, I'll just say, hey, had a really great event tonight. You know, 90% of the room scheduled meetings with us. By the way, here's how I started. I started off saying this. Oh, I also mentioned this. I mentioned this. Oh, don't forget at the end remember you said this don't forget that so I, i'll say that and i capture it why because it's never going to be more fresh in, in mind this right then and then what i do let's say the following week or even a month later or a year later on my way driving to seminar what do i play back that so it's the first the last thing i i, I said as i left the room i record and on my way to do it again i listen back i'm going to tell you right now it's so amazing because times I forget to listen back to that, I'll see my results down a little bit. But I'm telling you, it's 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 pretty amazing that whenever I do that, the results stay high. So that that connection piece, it's funny. I got the same advice when we were first starting the podcast, and I remember somebody told me radio's talking at people, yeah, podcasting's talking with people. Yes. And that's one of the things I love about it. Like, this is just a conversation. Yeah. This is a conversation we'd have. We just happen to be recording it and sharing it. And I'm like, hey, I hope this impacts an advisor out there that's listening in because I'd be having this conversation anyway. Yes. I geek out on this stuff. Oh, yeah. And it's it's cool because that's same concept works at a live experience. And I've seen a couple of things. I just took notes down here. You are nonverbals, and I don't know. I think part of it is you being Italian. So I'm going to give you that, like, you know, the, 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 the joke is Italians talk with their hands. Yeah. Like, 
your natural mannerisms, but I've also seen you refine them in your presentation where you will literally engage the audience with your nonverbals and you're not on a stage where you're behind some podium kind of like hiding behind it. You're literally out among the tables, the rounds. I mean, sometimes you like tap somebody on the shoulder. Like if you can tell that they're open to it, you know, they're engaging with you, but you're literally like holding almost, it feels like a family reunion sort of conversation in those rooms. Yes. And I think oftentimes when I watched others, it's kind of like, they're almost like not comfortable with themselves. They're stiff behind a podium. And I would just encourage like, just get out among the people and you'll yes. be amazed how that connection and those walls come down. hundred percent. Any other tips you would add there? Because you, you truly are a master at it. And just anything that goes through your head as you're presenting. Again, I mean, for me, it's just trying to be genuine, natural, authentic, and real. Mm-hmm. Right. But yeah, it's, uh, it's amazing. Like, if you have a room that has whatever, 50, 60, 80 people, though, even though those, like you may have two, three tables up front, the middle, the back, I'm telling you, <laughs> another thing I've noticed is if I don't walk around and make my way back to those back tables, the numbers are lower. Specifically in the back? 100%. Yeah. 100%. Because you don't realize it, but you know, having those tables that far back, yeah, I can see them, they can see me. But the connection's not there as much to when I literally will walk around it and walk up to tables and make eye contact with them and, and engage them. Um, literally, yeah, where you're you're including the entire room and everyone's engaged versus sometimes you'll, you'll forget and maybe you're just walking back and forth. I have a hard time just standing in one spot. I can't do that, right? Mm-hmm. So I, I like to be mobile and, and active. I spoke last night and a woman told me, she's like, your, your energy was was amazing you really you know drew me in and you know i had no luck to it she scheduled a meeting right so the entire table did so but but bringing that that energy and involvement where they're part of the room because i'm telling you if you speak an hour is a long time right and if they're in that back part of the room again i don't care how big your screen is i don't care how loud your speakers are you have to physically you know as they would say work the room you're, you're moving around the whole room well then Like, go back to college. Most of the people sitting in the back row were there for a reason. They're like, oh, I kind of want to pull their hoodie up and check out a little bit. So my guess is that tends to happen as seminars, too. So making sure you're literally pulling everybody into that conversation. Correct. Another tip you gave me that I've heard kind of counterintuitive, there's kind of two schools of thought. One is you're the celebrity where you kind of like walk on stage, do your thing, disappear in the back, like Elvis has left the, left the yep. building. And I, I think you've done that, but then you kind of shifted your mindset back to my goal is to connect. And if my goal is to connect, it's not to be like out the door and you've learned a few things just from a different approach at the end. So can you share those as well? Yeah, look, I, I early on, I'd heard people say, oh, hey, well, yeah, I, I'm the celebrity. You're almost, you know, the untouchable. Right. So I've heard people speak truly, and this is going back 15 years ago, 14, 50 years, where it's like, speak, and when you're done, walk right out the door. Mm-hmm. Why? Because they didn't want to take questions or what have you, right? So in the earlier days, I, I, I did that and quickly said, I don't like that. And I said, you know what? I am going to try to take questions at the end. So now you have to be careful because if you start, hey, are there any questions you have, that can open up a can of worms. Right. And look, there's some people who just want to be right. a on jag. Mic. Yeah, they want to be on the mic. Yeah. Hey. So it kind of jagged everybody. So I'm like, okay, that I don't like that. So what I do is I'll end and say, hey, uh, listen, what I'm going to do, I'm going to, you know, thanks again for coming tonight. I'm going to... Uh, stop by each table and just answer any quick lingering questions that you may have, but I'm going to stop by real quick before I head out. Now, number one, I told them I'm going to stop by to answer a quick lingering question. So the people that maybe are on the fence, they haven't checked. Yes, I want to come in for a meeting yet. Um, and maybe they're still on the fence. And if I would have just walked out the door, I'm too big for this. I'm a celebrity, you know, uh, Maybe they wouldn't, right? right? So, but I also say, uh, I'm gonna stop by quickly 
And so they also know I'm planting the seed. I can't hunker down at your table for 15 minutes, right? 20 minutes. Because I've got six, seven tables to stop by. So what I'll, I'll do is I, I do. Hey, thank you so much for coming. Appreciate you being here. Any quick questions you have before I head out? Say it again. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, Anthony, I did have a question. On this, this, that's something else. Uh, I've noticed if, if you were not to do that, that's the difference of getting, you know, maybe 60% and 80%, mm-hmm. okay? Because you can take someone who's on the fence, hasn't fully decided, and maybe they had a question that was pretty simple. I had somebody last night. It's, uh, well, yeah, I was going to come in to visit with you, but, you know, I'm still working. And I'm like, well, if you don't mind me asking, what's, what's your current age? I'm, I'm 62. I said, oh, well, how long have you been with your company? I've been there 18 years. I said, really? I said, did you know that 90% of 401k companies allow you to do an in-service rollover? Even if you plan to work to 70, we can get, you know, help roll some of that out. Really? Yeah. Oh, I didn't realize it. There you go. See what I mean? So that's the difference of taking a moment to stop by each table to engage, you know, and answer any quick quick questions. You're already there. You already invested the time. You already invested the money. What's well, another 10 minutes for yeah. 25% better results? Not to mention, by making that last touch, it's uh, you can't quantify the impact that has on the stick ratio of people that come out by taking that one last time, because people say, thanks for coming by, you know? And by stick ratio, they booked at the live event. Mm-hmm. Do they actually show up to the office for the first time? That's right. Yeah. I'm, I'm solidifying that they're coming in as well. Because mm-hmm. then I'll say, even a couple people, it's, I'll see it, then they, they scheduled uh, April 8th. And I'm like, oh, that sounds sound good. When are you coming in? Oh, oh, yeah, next Thursday. Sounds great. Well, hey, our team looks forward to meet with you. Well, that's something else is the question of transitioning, I make it very well known. When you come in to meet with our team, when you meet with our team, when you meet with our team, so I'm letting them know it's not me, right? Uh, you meet with us, and I'll still get people like, hey, can we? And I'm still, it's very hard. I'm kind of quarterbacking everything. I still have involvement, but you will end up meeting with one of our fiduciary advisors, and we work as a team, team, team. Now I'm also helping remove me from the expectation that I'm the one. But it also gives them comfort. The guy they liked, the guy they connected with, the guy they're scheduling to come visit with his team, he's still quarterbacking and involved, which I am, you know, still involved with everything. That's that's uh, that last tip right there. Words matter. Oh, we say that a lot. Yes. But just the intentionality of removing the eye. And by the way, that's a lot of advice because it's back to that, oh, I've built this thing. It's kind of my ego. Like they need to meet with me. Yes. How were you able, was it as easy as just one day? It was I at one event and the next one it was we and team? <laughs> or was that like, oh man, I took a couple steps forward, a couple steps back and like had to slowly get myself there. Pretty much. It was one of those, that that was a rip the bandaid off moment. Mm-hmm. That was like, no, I have to. And it was just like, it's when you meet with us, when you visit our team, when you visit our team, when you visit our team, when you meet with our team, and, and I'll say it a few times throughout, so I'm kind of planting the seed, mm-hmm. and uh, it hasn't impacted it. Yeah. I thought it would, but it, but it hasn't. Mm-hmm. Look, somebody goes to Sh- Charles Schwab, they think they're going to meet with Chuck? No, remember they ran a huge ad campaign, talk to Chuck, mm-hmm. right? No one's talking to Chuck, right? Same thing, if I'm up there speaking, I've set the table that you're going to meet with somebody else, and it hasn't you know, the impact of that. When's the last time you ran an appointment? Uh, like a real appointment? Yeah, like a true first, second, like all the way through. Oh my goodness. True first, second, whenever yeah. that, it's got to be at least three years. And during that three years, yeah. what's your growth been as a firm? <laughs> and that, that's funny. And I hear, that's another ego check or uh, seeing yourself as the constraint there of by fully removing myself, that is when we went, right, from, you know, 87, 91 million to year over year, 171, uh, 210, pace it over 250. Yeah. Those years was me getting out. I, I listen, from time to time, I, I had uh, somebody like, no, 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 I have to be with, I have to be with the other day. And I li- really pulled the Heisman. <laughs> like, I can't do that. Uh, a couple people, there was once twice when I said, okay, 
Um, I'm going to be in town that day, high net worth, you know, person. But we had value to everybody. But I said, okay, it just so happens to the high net worth client, and and I'm going to be in town. So I'll tell you what, um, put it on another advisor's calendar and block me off for the first 30 minutes. And then basically I came in and it was you, what do you like what, to say? What's your phrase? What what you, you, blessed, you blessed the meaning. <laughs> blessed the meaning. And I think you even did that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you get the holy water. Yeah. You know. No, I'm kidding. So just kidding. But uh, no, it's, it's no, basically. But, but like you swung by. Yes. You said, hey, like it was the relationship side. Hey, yes. how are the kids? How are the grandkids? How was the last trip? Yes. And hey, I'm here. I'm not going anywhere, but you're in great hands because now, like, here's the truth. You're building better plans by getting the hell yes. out of the way. Yes. Like, how, is it, how good was Anthony's plan when he was running 15 appointments a day, yes. giving a seminar that night, yes. rinse, repeat, yes. consistently? Now, as you've built out the team, you're actually doing better planning. Yep. Your advisors are loving more on the clients than you ever could by yourself. More time. And now we've freed you up to actually help more retirees in the market you're in because now that is your skill set and that is where you can start to feed the calendar for, for your team. 100 percent, Brad. And you know, as much as they connect with you, it's I know what's best for them that my time being limited, I can't serve you in the way that you deserve to be served. Right? Yeah, and kind of our mantra here, our mindset, our company's language is, we, you know, we want to help clients uh, live a life in retirement worthy of the sacrifices that it took for them to get there. Because otherwise, what was the last 40 years of getting up every day, going out to work, kind of weird? Some Chris Smith that. languaging there. Love Chris Smith. It is la language is phenomenal. Yeah. If, it, you, it makes if you are listening to this episode and you have not gone back and listened to episode five with Chris Smith, him and Anthony have done a ton of work together on the messaging, which I've seen you weave into the radio, the yeah. TV, the seminars, yes. and it's, it's really good stuff. Once again, you've continued to be a student yeah. and evolve yeah. upon the work you've already done. It, it, it bred to the point now where if I, uh, one thing I want to add about the seminar, then we'll move, move on to something else I'm already share with you, but I also have a saying is selling is not telling. Advising is not telling. It's asking thought provoking questions and getting the people to really tell you, share what their concerns are, their biggest concerns and, and problems and, and, and what have you. And, and if you ask the questions thought provoking, they'll tell you, here's my biggest concerns. Here's my biggest pain points. And then you can go as a financial advisor, create a plan that solves for their needs, their concerns, their pain points, and there is no self, yeah. right? You're providing a solution to their concerns because if you just sit there and talk, 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 it's, you can't have a cookie cutter approach like a wind up dial, you have to do that. One other thing, uh, to the point now, let's talk about Joe, right? Newer advisor, 24 years of age, uh, spent what nine months, I believe, at Thrivent, you know, financial. And here, call Aunt Betty 16 times and Uncle Lou in a bright. So, do I bet there's a lot of Uncle Lou's <laughs> other conference. <laughs> <laughs> probably, there probably are. So, uh, and yeah, and it was like, so we, we took somebody who had great skill sets, great personality, and drive, wanted to work hard and plugging them into the process that we follow, right? Mm -hmm. And many of our, you know, the advisors part of the triad community follow to the point where it's it's provable. It's like, my goodness, here's a guy that first full year in the business with us, we said, here, just shut up, listen to what, you know, our, our style is, listen to how we run a meeting. He's like, great, I'm a student, what, what should I do? So he sat in with one of our advisors over and over and over, you know, for a few months, listen to everything he said. You guys have done a phenomenal job of creating basically like a library of training videos, right? And I'm like, Joe, here, sit in this conference room and just watch the first meeting run over and over again, meeting two over and over again, to the point where it's, we got him early and corrected any bad habits. And now then he, I think it was 30 million or so, right, this first full year, he's pacing He'll do somewhere between 40, 40 to 50. I think he can hit 50 million second full year. 
and that's these are, is a product of the environment and mm -hmm. uh, the process we put together. What's crazy is in two years under Goldstone's roof, he's outperforming 99.9% .9 of advisors that have been doing this their entire lives. You said a little bit earlier, kind of having one foot in two different models. Yes. And one of the things I'd seen a lot of founding advisors struggle with was kind of like this 20, 30 years of knowledge. How do I download that out of my brain into the young go giver that's 24, that's got all the energy in the world? Yep. And one, what I've seen from you is you saw a firm on the East Coast, SHP, you mentioned them earlier. They had a very dialed in first, second, third, a very holistic approach built on a CFP standard. And you're like, okay, I kind of grew up in the sales side of it. Yes. Like, okay, hey, here's your sales presentation. Do you want product A, B, or C? Yeah. And I saw you shift just before we started recording here today. Viet, literally, you hired him. This is, dude's like an e money guru. Crazy. I mean, yeah. Trade it I'm money. guessing Anthony wasn't uh, building plans like Viet can build them, right? Correct. So, so that's what I, I just love. Like as you start to look through the lens of a business owner, what's the more efficient way to scale a business? Now I remove myself from the planning because guess what? There's guys out there that love planning and literally geek out on it, and they're coming to you like, hey. We got this new scenario. I need money. I want to make yeah. sure you know there's a new tax planning law. I want to make sure you know about it. But the the other piece of that, Joey. I call him Joey. You call yeah, him Joe. Joey. But yeah. I'll always know him yeah. as Joey. Joey the young that's guy. Guy. Yeah, but uh, I, didn't get it. I remember meeting him, and I've seen a lot of guys. If you're an advisor out there, you're young. You're in your twenties. You're just getting going. I see a lot of advisors at that age. They're like thrown in the deep end. Yeah, they don't know how to swim, and they're like, "How do I not drown?" Yep. And what he instead had was a systematic model, a structured first, a structured way to close the first, to move into the second, high level, you've got these problems we had covered. If you want us to build a custom plan to solve them, here's step one, move the funds over so we can start to build the plan. But you just gave him the greatest gift that a 22, 23, 24-year-old advisor can get, which is a system and a framework that's proven and that's easy to follow if you're willing to put in the work. Yes. And that's where like the magic happens because removed the ego aside. Yep. Yeah, that's a lot of times just getting the founder's way, right? Yes. And then put in the work of time that here's a duplicatable process, invested six months of shadowing. Yes. Which is a true investment. Yes. But now two years. Yes. 50 mil. Yes. Right. We've taken the learning curve and significantly reduce that. Because when I think what it took for me when I was doing everything, back-to-back yeah. -back meeting, meeting, running, that guy's do this, not stop, every paperwork, everything, what it took for me to hit 65 million, how many years it took to do that as an individual, and now to remove myself, build a team, empower them, take everything off of them, and just focus on your strengths, and to get within two years to 50 million, where my high was 65 as an individual, took you know, a decade almost to get there. So I love the speed at yeah. which we're, we're shortening that learning curve. And in fact, a couple of things he said, gosh, yeah, they, I can't believe, you know, at my age, I'm already hitting these levels. I'm like, and I'm just continuing to get him to continue believing in himself. You're going to do this. Because he started here, he goes, oh, 30 million is my goal, my child. Well, I mean, it didn't want to, okay, so one other thing we skipped. So Brian was your first Joey, right? Yeah, yeah. He did... 80 and change last year? <sighs> am I yeah. I'm, I'm low? And he go triple digits. 114 and change. 114 million. So, so okay, so we kind of broke this down. Marketing, sales, ops, the before, the during, the after. Brian now yes. does not step out of the sales. That's correct. Channel, right? So he's just literally getting appointments on his calendar yes. every day. Yes. And the guy is just oh, one of the most gifted connectors, yes. uh, like can simplify things. He's a whiteboard, like just up on a whiteboard and it's like, oh, this never made sense. Now it does. Yes. I believe Joey trained under Brian, not Anthony. Correct. So Brian is a product of me. Yep. You know, 114 million last year of, of, of business. Joey's a, produ uh, a, a product of him. Yeah. So there's that evolution. And um, but the other thing is Go back to the thing I said earlier, that book, The One Thing, right? So we got to point, say, hey, the one thing for Brian is to focus on meeting with clients. 
where now we're building a team under Brian mm -hmm. in which he's just doing that and he's so allowing. He's literally in the background of the video right there. Yeah, he There's is. the man himself. Yeah. The legend. He's walking out of crying. Right <laughs> yeah. See his manner is out right there. He could see his person. I hope that was captured on video. That, that's that's phenomenal. But uh, it, it, truth be told, Brad, Brad, right now at this moment, one of the things we'll do is I, I believe that if I can take the knowledge that I have and share it right with other advisors too to help them get better and better their lives, and quite frankly, be able to spend more family time, time with your kids. And that's something that's a feel good thing for me. As I'm sitting here right now, I've got two advisors, right? That will invite them to come up, mentor with us. I've got two advisors from the- Yeah, care. two, to literally, right here, Matt and Byron. When I walked in, I'm like, I'm like, wait, Byron, what? And I like did a double, you know when you see somebody, <laughs> yeah, right. not where you think- Yeah, you, you should be in Carolina, or you invited in Chicago. I'm like, oh, shoot, they came in because we've got the scale summit going on after this. So they just came in a day early to do a little check. Correct. And yeah. So you, we've got uh, uh, an advisor that's been in the business, I don't know, whatever Matt has, but at least a dozen years, a dozen year advisor that's sitting in shadowing with an advisor that's in the game two years, learning from him, the guy that's paid well, 50 million. By the way, yeah. if Matt is no slouch, she'll no. do. He'll probably do 30, 40, 50 million yeah. on the fixed side, another two, three million target on the life side. Yeah. And then let alone how many assets. Oh, he's an incredibly successful guy. Yeah. But that that's also a tribute to Matt to say, puts his ego aside to say, hey, I can learn about, you know, some things. Matt's crushing it. But my point yeah. is he said, hey, what's what's this guy doing, this young guy? Let's take some uh, learnings from him and then fire in one of his advisors, check him out. So, uh, Point is that guy, young guy, two years is already helping mentor. But that's our iron sharpening iron that takes place here. We'll have multiple, uh, you know, events over the course of the year where other advisors will fly up here, kind of mentor, or get to from for well, that was one of the things. And it's always it's e it's easier in business when you're small to yep. be intimate and pour in. It's tough as you scale and get bigger. Yeah. And that was one of the things I've seen happen in the brokerage world that I grew up in a lot is everybody loved it when it was small and then it gets big and you feel like you're just a number. And that was one of the things like we intentionally did this year. We formed triad packs. We had to give the, the wink to you yeah. to name them. Right. Yeah. And now we've got groups of, you know, four, six, eight. And one of the common themes we've seen is that, Hey, I'd love to come. It's almost like, uh, it's like, what do they call that when you're, when you're doing a, an open house, yeah, except it's kind of open office, right? Yeah, yeah. And so you're walking through, you're like, oh, okay, cool. I like how Anthony laid out the lobby here. Oh, cool. He's got the recording studio right off the lobby. So it's a little bit of wow factor when a new person walks through for the first time. But it's just kind of success leaves clues, that yes. concept of like, oh, I can take a little bit from Matt. Yes. Uh, learn some stuff of how he positions life insurance. Oh, look at Anthony's layout. And these packs, one of the biggest requests was, Hey, can we do at least one of these a year in person? And we'd love to like do this open office concept to where we can like go do something fun, experiential, but also like check out somebody's office environment, team structure, all that. It's been really cool to see how that the community has said, Hey, can we do more of this? That that Brad, that was huge because uh two years ago, right? Two years ago, one was posted in Boston. And what I like is I've gone to other events in the past with FMOs and you go there, huge events, you know, tons of people, and you have these speakers, you take all these notes, and you come home, and you've got all these ideas, and then you come back, and you're playing catch-up for being gone, Yeah. right? And then you're out to the next thing and the, the other uh, parts of your business that are already in motion, and what happens to all those ideas and notes? On the back burner. You, you find them, like, two years later in your cabinet. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. There was that one idea. Yes, this yeah. light and nice no, notepad and all yeah. that time. And nothing was implemented. So game changer, in my view, is uh, I end up, if you recall, I brought like, you know, 14 people, right? Yeah. So Your whole team. My whole team. So in lieu of just being an advisor and then all these ideas, flood of them, and trying to explain your version, watered down version to them on what to do to that department, your planning department, your client relations, transfer department, whatever, you guys gave us the opportunity to say, no, 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 bring your team. And then we have breakout sessions where the account specialist transfer department, they all meet other offices together. And they're 
iron sharpening iron, idea sharing. And then you've got the advisors meeting together and then the business owner CEO groups meeting together and then come together. It was transformational. I definitely attribute some of that to that hockey stick mm -hmm. where it wasn't just on the individual, but team, team, team. And then going forward, I think on a, on a monthly basis, they'll all sync up for like a, a Zoom call together and keep that going. Now, I, it's not relying upon me training these people. You guys are helping where each department is kind of training themselves. What does that do for me? That frees up my time to focus more on things I love to do, the marketing, the rainmaking, to fill calendars. And that's how that Michael Hyatt step aside, watch it grow and, and have the business on autopilot. That's definitely attributed to that as well. Yeah, it, this is not rocket science. <laughs> yeah. One of the things we try to do at Triad is just listen. Yeah. Ask questions, listen, observe. And one of the biggest disconnects I saw, it's like you were kind of explaining, it's like the old game of telephone where you've got like 10 kids on the line and you say one thing on one side yeah. and pass the message. Yeah. And by the time you get to the 10th kid, it's like, yeah. wait, that's not even close. Yeah. That's what our industry was doing where it's like, oh, fly all these advisors out, wine them, dine them, you know, incredible steak dinners and great bottles of wine. Trust me, I've benefited from many of those dinners and I enjoy them. Yeah. But it was like this game of telephone where, hey, there was these five marketing ideas. Oh, there was this CRM concept. Now, three days later, rolling into a full calendar that's stacked because you were out the week before. Yep. And by the way, I say this like from the kindness of my heart, the best advisors in the world are typically the worst ops people in the world. Yeah. The, the sales skill set and connection skill set very rarely translates to high organizational yep. follow through. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. And so you got the sales guy that's maybe a little scatterbrained, a little ADD, which guilty, sure. right? Right there. Now trying to explain an, a operation that takes 17 steps, it is like everything is lost in translation. And on the flip side, I've seen the other side of that where the team members go out and yeah. they get trained on some CRM system. Now they're coming back feeling helpless because they've got their list of to-dos. And now you're like, well, Anthony's like jamming appointments from eight to five, or hey, he's got a speaking presentation tonight. And so, not rocket science. No. One team, one experience. Bring it all together. And every successful advisor that I've ever talked with has always told me I benefited from my peers, iron sharpens iron, that were a little further down the path than I was. It's like, guess what? That same system works for your team too. Yes. Why would you, Michelle? Yes. SHP COO. How many COOs has she minted in her career? And now it's like, why wouldn't you just create a avenue for that to happen really easily? Because guess what? Brad shouldn't be training and Anthony shouldn't be training the next COO in line. Yeah. Should be somebody that's lived that. Yeah, that's know. that's their role, right? And if, if you guys are, are willing to put people together that are willing to share their knowledge, and then they, as you would say, like geek out in a healthy way, mm -hmm. that our team looks forward to those meetings. They look forward to those Zoom calls. And it's, again, that takes it off me to focus on continuing to, to grow the business and hence working on the business, not in the business, to where they're all training and learning from each other segmented each department yeah so it's it's been uh, a huge benefit for our, our company well you as a business owner too there's another thing that i've seen your team is being poured into and invested in like you you know we're doing this one in chicago so it's a short drive but you know you flew the vast majority of your team to boston they did hotels yeah, yeah. And, and like we try to do our stuff dvdl so we also you know checked out a red sox game so it was the fun part because yeah. i think oftentimes and this is if you're a founder out there listening in here's a good thing to think about when it comes to your culture oftentimes you get the fun piece right you get the trips the you know the cool experiences the cool speakers and honestly, your team can start to resent that. Yeah. Right. It's like, yeah. well, Anthony always gets flown all over the place. He gets wined and dined. What about me? I'm back here slaving away, yes. working my butt off yes. to serve these clients. And so I would just challenge you if you're a founder listening in out there, how can I reward my team, empower my team, and where they see, like, wow, they care. Yes. Anthony cares about me. I'm including. And he's investing into my future. Yes. You know? Look, when they're included, uh, 
you're right. I mean, they're, they're, you know, for all the good, right reasons, buying into the dream and they see it. It's like, you know, it's not just a singular thing. Anthony's just worried about himself. It's no, I want to see them thrive too. Yeah. And, and I'm telling you, it is a compound effect. And, uh, and it creates a buzz around the office. And again, they really get excited about it. And, you know, go back to, you know, with, with Joe having the advisors here, I really do feel continue to share what's gotten you here, right? And I have another great book that I haven't read, okay? And I'll save a hack for, for people watching this in a moment about not having time to read books, but I met the author and the title of his book shows a guy staying on the top rung of the ladder and he's reaching to a ladder that's coming down and it's called, What Got You Here Won't Get You There, right? So have an opportunity to have advisors, you know, throughout the year come visit with us to see if they can learn and take their practice to the next level is, is huge. And we give that opportunity, right, to, to certain people come and visit. Um, and I just think it's, I'm a visual learner. So you can tell me, hey, there's an office in Boston that they're doing this, they're doing this, you should check it out. Oh, they did this. And I'm thinking, how, how is that possible? What are they doing? So I'm a visual guy. You can tell me, I can hear about it, I can read about it. But if I see it, I'm like, okay, then the aha moment. I'm like, I'm seeing it take place. That's what happened for us. Once everyone is seeing hands on, this is how their office operates. This is what each department does. This is what you're actually seeing it explained to you, not hearing about it. I can't say enough about, you know, a summit, scale summit type of all. Uh, to me, that's one of the biggest hacks. There's a reason Tony Robbins does what he calls full immersion. Mm -hmm. and, and his, you know, he's kind of, become famous because like, oh, it's like 45 degrees in the room. I'm like freezing to death. Mm -hmm. So I stay wide awake and then he's going from like seven in the morning to midnight. It's crazy. Now, I don't recommend taking it quite to that level, but I will say there's something in the immersion where oftentimes where I've seen advisors struggle or be frustrated. It's like, man, I just, it's taken forever to train this person up. We've been trying to train them for a month, two months. The shortest hack from my experience is a full immersive experience a day, day and a half, two days, literally rubbing elbows with somebody in your exact same position, just a few years down the road, maybe a little further in front of you. Yeah. But now when they can see it and like, oh, okay, this is how I get in to firelight to do the e-app. Oh, here's how I run these different scenarios inside of e-money or whatever the planning software is. And it's, it's this like immersive experience where they're actually participating Yes. And it versus just like watching some video on some portal or something. Yes. Like that. Not that those aren't also no, great. Correct. You know, yeah. But it's just like the shortest, the shortest hack I've seen to accelerating growth is literally immersive experiences where they're just surrounded by yeah. by people that have just been there and done that. Yeah. You're you're actually seeing it take LA yeah. seeing it in action, you know. So agreed. Well, my man, this is, I think we set a new record. Well, we have. So you'll be proud to know it was an Enneagram 3. We've got a new record for the longest episode. Come on. Yeah. Really? The do business, dude. I told you to fly, man. Yeah. Um, so, wait, wait, real quick. So I do want to just share okay. for the guy who, all these books, but I don't read, right? So there is uh, a little hack, right? So, hold on. I'm still full. Okay. So there's a company. I think everybody should check this out. It is called, I know the name of the dang company. Uh, it's called the Pro Productivity Game. Productivity Game. And, and what they do for those who don't have time to like, you know, read books because uh, everyone's so darn busy, you can sign up for this. And what they do is they'll send you, so they'll send you a weekly breakdown. So for instance, they, the company reads the book, it's called the productivity game. They read the book and then they send you a book summary. And then they also send you basically a core video message that will be typically somewhere between six to eight minutes. Okay, here you go. This one's eight minutes and 28 seconds, and it'll be a short video that kind of gives a, a, a highlighted summary, almost in like, I don't know, like a cartoon style mm -hmm. fashion or something, productivity game. And so I get these, visuals. they put visuals. Stolen focus, but Yohan Hari, 
You follow me? Mm -hmm. Focus equals fulfillment. Focus equals fulfillment. So, and what they do is they'll break the book yeah. down where literally in eight minutes, what would have taken however long to show, you know, two, three, four hundred page book that's broken down. Then in addition to the video, they give you a uh, one page summary as well as a more detailed like eight page summary. The productivity game. Productivity game. And it's a lot of business building books. This one is stolen focus. You get them every Sunday night. And, and it's like I said, uh, yeah, so it's like one page PDF. And then they'll have like a, a multi-page, but again, it is a massive time saver. You know, for instance, this has like the six pager that'll break it down. Um, saves a ton of time productivity. I see, I've seen I've seen I've seen apps that you know audio summaries. I've never seen one though where it actually does visuals with the book. So now you have to see it in the framework. Hundred percent. Yeah. So you get the six six to eight minute video with the framework. It's literally like you've just read the whole thing. And then after I do that, I'll give a quick glance to perhaps the one page summary. Mm -hmm. And between that, it's like, I just saved the time to read a two, three, four hundred page. And slide, what you just did, what movie was it where it was like, why would you do eight minute abs? But you can do <laughs> six, seven, yeah, seven, 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 Dumb and Dumber, right? Was it Dumb and Dumber? I don't, I don't, it's not Dumb and Dumber because I would know that one. I, I want to say it was like a Ben Stiller movie. Was it? Was it? Was it? What's the Six, one where he's the gem, a gem honor? Oh, uh, was that dodgeball? I have raised the, so, yeah, hey, yeah. somebody that's listening to this, post or, or, or Charlie, as you do the show notes, throw the movie in, because I don't know. It, I think it's a Ben Stiller movie. So, but you, yeah, the whole mindset was eight minute abs was out. I'm going to become a billionaire. Yeah. Oh, seven, seven minute <laughs> abs. Why would people do eight when you could do seven? Yeah, so, fun spot, man. Well, as we wrap here, um, man, we hit a ton. Yeah. So, so thanks for just as always, just over serving, sharing, being an open book. And one of the things that I've asked everybody so far, this is the new business, new life podcast. Um, I would love to just wrap by asking you, how do you define do business, do life? Do business, do life for me is I'm, I'm living it. Right, so it's it's having a balance to which you can still maintain a, a thriving business that's not dependent upon you, but do not sacrifice without sacrificing the time, you know, for my family. So it's having a business that affords me the opportunity to be able to do all the cool things I want to do with my family. You know, spring break we just brought the boys to uh, Costa Rica. We jam so many adventurous things in there, and for me, it's it's uh, idea creation. Those memories, or I should say, more memory memory creation. It's it's creating all those memories that are going to stick with my kids long after I'm gone. Mm -hmm. That to me is doing life right. So it's not, you know, you're so successful, you left behind so much money. Forget that. It's like. The memories. I want my kids years after I'm gone to smile and tell their kids or grandkids about the stories that they were, you know, zip lining over 300 foot drops or this and doing all these cool things. So uh, that to me is is my do business do life type of mindset. Well, uh, it's super rewarding to me, Anthony. To like, number one, I'm not taking any credit. I appreciate the credit you've sent my way, but what I love is just how you've always shown up. As just like one of my favorite people, like the, the room lights up when you walk in okay. and just this boundless energy. And, but I'll tell you what I remember, and this is going way back. Everybody was always like, man, I just love that Anthony guy. And the reason being is because you love people and you just do, and you can't fake that. And you've always like done, doesn't matter if it's the janitor taking out the trash. You're looking them in the eye. Hey, really appreciate you taking care of that. And it's cool to see how you've now built a business that's created freedom so you can show up how you want to for your family. And that's like the most rewarding work that I could even be connected to in any remote way. And so I just, thanks for coming on here. Thanks for sharing. I promise there's a lot of advisors out there that benefited from this conversation. And uh, looking forward to hanging. Thanks, man. And, and, and you know, my mindset is, I've heard this, years ago and I've applied it to my life is 
people will forget 90% of what you say, but they'll remember how you made them feel. So, hey, same right back at you, man. I appreciate you having me on it. I appreciate that you came out and did it right here in our, our studio. So always, always great time with you. So, all right, my man. Well, we'll, we'll cut this one off. Probably bring you back for another one. Appreciate it. Yeah, sounds good. Thanks, right. man.